guest today is Adam Jones. Adam, how are you doing? Good, good. Nice to meet you, David. Nice to meet you. Uh, tell me, what, what do you do? I actually know this already, but I'm tell a, me. <laughs> I'm a software engineer with LHP Telematics, uh -huh. and my role involves a variety of things because we're a small company. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm in charge of the architecture and implementation of our system for tracking assets all over the globe. I actually did know all that. Yes. <laughs> so you're we, also, I do know you're the principal of the company as well. That's right. So we have uh, several owners in the company and several owners outside the company. Um, so I'm one of the four that are inside the company. Okay. Um, and what does uh, it's a LHP? What, the, what does LHP do? Left hand plane is the uh, the acronym, okay. just because I know that's going to come up. But uh, LHP, what we do is we track assets around the globe. So if it's a construction or agricultural piece of equipment, mm -hmm. we can track it. We do that for the fleet operators, so that's the end user of that equipment. Mm -hmm. We also do it for the OEMs that make that equipment. They each have their own needs for that equipment. You say when well, you track it, you're tracking the location of the asset? We'll track anything we can find off that equipment. We'll track the location, so latitude, longitude, altitude, anything we can get off the GPS chip on there. So it's right. speed, heading, uh, if it's accelerating quickly, if it's decelerating qu quickly, uh, if someone's driving it obnoxiously, we can find that out. Interesting. Uh, right. But we also try and read off of the engine. Um, now the, there's a CAN bus, which is a network that all of the electronics in that asset are connected to. Hmm. And so we can read engine oil pressure, fuel levels, battery voltage, uh, the RPM of the engine, and what's really key is, is getting any kind of diagnostic trouble codes off of that equipment as well. All right. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a piece of hardware that plugs into um, some heavy machinery. That's right. Uh, we go from passenger vehicles all the way up to the largest cranes you can imagine. There are some that are so large we actually have to mount two GPS uh, receivers on because they're so far apart. That boom arm is so far from the center oh. of the crane that we have to get the second one on there. Okay. So I've got a couple samples here. So, this, right. would be so this, is, this is hardware. So you, you don't make the hardware, right? You make That's the right. software that goes into the hardware. That's exactly right. All right. And in some cases, it's it's very native to the unit. We'll make firmware that's embedded on here. And mm -hmm. other times, we're just doing configuration. It depends on the complexity of the unit we're installing and what that customer needs. So we go from everything as simple as this, which you might have seen in, a, in an insurance commercial that you can click into your own car. It's an mm -hmm. OBD connector. OBD is what? Onboard diagnostics. Okay. So if you ever if you like adventuring in your car, you can look under the dash, and there's one of these connectors. Mm -hmm. Okay. To uh, something a little bit more complex, this will tie into the CAN bus on a diesel engine. Uh, to something that's I haven't brought with me, but it's a much larger piece of equipment. It's hardened for vibration and dust, and all the other environmental factors that might go on at a construction site. Mm, okay. Um, so you're taking all this data and uh, you're storing it where? Are you storing it on the device itself, or are you sending it out to some server somewhere? Uh, both. Uh, what happens is that because we're talking about a unit in the field, we don't know what the cellular reception is going to be like. Mm. So as the unit's recording, it's recording into a queue on the device itself. Mm -hmm. But then once it gets into cellular range, it's going to transmit all of that to our back end, which we're hosting on Azure. All right, let's talk about that a little bit. Actually, this, my show is called Technology and Friends. Yeah. Let's get into the technology of it. Uh, first of all, why Azure? Well, we had been hosting locally with a, a service provider here that could host a rack of equipment for us. Okay. And based on our size, that worked pretty well. We okay. had a, a single database instance of SQL Server. We had a single listening service, which was receiving all this data coming in. We had a single business logic server. And then we had a couple one-offs. You know, a couple customers wanted to have their own system separate from everything else. That was fine at a small size. But we've had an investment recently where we're going to grow exponentially. Mm -hmm. And we knew that we were going to have scaling issues. And we we're also going to have issues with the cost of doing things ourselves locally at this hosting center. Mm. Uh, we looked at license costs were going to be exorbitant. We looked at the cost of equipment was going to be exorbitant. Maintaining a staff to, to handle that, we just couldn't grow quickly enough. Okay. And that's really where the Azure service appealed to us is that one, we could have a huge cost savings, we could reduce our workforce, and we could have future scalability for any level we might grow to. Interesting. Yeah, that's I hear that time and again with the scalability is a, a major factor in moving to Azure. Not only the fact that they that you can scale because Microsoft has invested just huge amounts in hardware, but the ease of scaling, just changing a configuration setting. Oh yeah. As opposed to going out and buying servers, installing software. That's we were giddy when we saw the slider bar on cloud services that you could say slide up and yep. say, give me two, three, four more nodes to mm -hmm. process this workload. Right. Yeah. And that's uh, that's that's pretty simple. Whereas if you bought it yourself, uh, provisioning oh, servers yeah. is, is a big deal. On so. Azure, you slide that bar, to, that bar up, you get your second node, it takes maybe 10 minutes for it to deploy. Right. To do that same thing in our, our own hosting center, one, you have to buy the equipment. Let's say you get overnight shipping, well, there's your first 24 hours gone. Right. Then you've got to get somebody to go with that equipment to the hosting center, right. then they've got to load the software on it, and they've got to integrate it with the other nodes. You could be talking weeks. It could be easily. a very long time. Yeah. Um, so are, are, you, are you selling these right now, or are you developing them? 
preparing yes, this to sell. Yes, this is in the field now. The field we now. have uh, two customers that are on the Azure site currently, and we're moving the rest of them this year. Okay, so right now the scalability is not an issue. You're just going with one instance of everything, correct? Actually, we've hit a couple times where we've seen, based on the auto scaling factor that we put in, okay. that our CPU or queue size has reached the threshold, and we've seen them scale up and down. Oh, okay. And the reason for that is that right now, one of our customers has dictated that all units call in at the same time of day. Ah, so you have peak loads. We have peak loads. Right. So one of the things we're going to look at is because we know those are coming in at a certain time, Azure allows us to set up a, a scheduled scaling. So we can say we know at midnight when these units call in, we need to have those units, those nodes scaled up. Mm -hmm. So we can have them pre-scaled up in preparation for that load. And then once the load is passed, scale them back down. Excellent. <laughs> Tell me a little, about, a little bit about the architecture. Uh, how does information get from here into SQL Server. That's that's really the, the start and end point of this, right? Our architecture is really interesting because the flow of data from a device in the field to our servers is anything but simple. Uh, we have a number of factors we have to look at. The first of which is, does this unit have cellular connectivity? Mm -hmm. So that's the first issue. And we could be working with AT&T or Verizon or Vodafone or a number of cellular providers. Mm -hmm. And when you start talking globally, there are all sorts of restrictions on where that SIM is allowed to operate. Ah. So the first trick is, can we just get it online? Right. If we can get it online, and let's say it has 2G or 3G service, at that time we're ready to send the data, and it has to be routed through the cellular provider. And we have to do that in a secure way because nobody wants to see their data over the air, unencrypted, in plain text. So we have a VPN connection from that cellular provider. In many cases, we're using AT&T's Jasper service. I'm not aware of that. Jasper is what? Uh, Jasper is a commercial arm of AT&T. Okay. Uh, we also have Wireless as another provider we work with, which is a, a lesser known cellular provider. But they have a VPN directly from their data center to our Azure instance. Mm -hmm. So okay. we have guaranteed encrypted traffic between the two. Okay, so if it can get to AT&T, for example, it can get to you pretty yes, quickly. Yes, that's right. But uh, so it flows from, AT is an issue. flows from the device through our cellular provider through that VPN to our Azure Affinity Group, mm -hmm. where that's hosted. And then from there, we have a node we call a listener. So each of these devices supports a different protocol. They're all talking a different language. We need to be able to interpret what that means. And we have a variety of listeners that all understand a variety of languages. Mm. We're built on another framework called End Service Bus. Okay. So we use that parsed data that we've received. We packetize it into a message. Mm -hmm. And then we use End Service Bus to put it into an Azure Service Bus queue. Okay. So we have a variety of queues. And now we can break down this work into units of work that can all be spread among very small but focused nodes. Okay. So we have a number of cloud services that are focused on. One is responsible for recording to the data to the database. Okay. This, these are Azure worker rules. That's exactly right. right. Yeah. So uh, we have one that's it's just going to persist data to the database. Mm -hmm. We have another one that's going to analyze that data to say, is this a geofence violation? Geofences are you create an imaginary boundary around your worksite, okay. and you want to know did somebody take my equipment outside the worksite? Oh, okay. You know, it's a, a very quick way to know maybe somebody's driving their their Ford F one fifty to the pub. Right. and they're not allowed to do that. Or maybe somebody tried to drive a bobcat off your worksite. Mm. You want to know. And right. so we can tell you right away, okay, you've broken a geofence. Let's alert. Let's send that to another node, which is our alerting engine, where we can escalate that through an email or an SMS or some other message to let them know, you need to look at this asset right now. Hmm. Uh, I'm curious, did you look at BizTalk at all for that sort of workflow and uh, queuing? And we looked at a variety work? of things. Um, BizTalk was one. Huh? Our previous system had been built on End Service Bus, mm -hmm. and what we found is that End Service Bus had Azure compatibility built in. Okay. So it was a very easy transition from our own hosting to hosting on Azure. Okay. All right. Uh, so it's in the database, and then it stays in the database until, uh, is it, or what happens after that? Is it, are you pulling it out of there? Are you reporting on it? We do. We have, we have a variety of ways that that works. Some customers want us to host the portal for them to view that data. So we have our own portal that they can come and, and view it. They pull up the website. They look at their asset. They get reporting on our website. So there okay. it's just feeding from that database. Okay. In other cases, they have their own back end already set up. And what they'd rather see is that data to flow to their system. Okay. So we have, we call them custom third party senders. Mm. But depending on the customer, we can route that data to the sender and then we'll feed that to their back end. Okay. So now it's visible with, you know, their own homegrown system. All so right. if you're a customer of, let's say, John Deere or Vermeer, you can see that data in the portal you're already custom to. Okay, very cool. Um, anything we haven't talked about we should? Uh, this, there's Especially a lot we've done on the this technology past year. Side. Yeah, That's what really it's been on. really exciting making that transition to Azure. Um, it sounds the like scalability has been are you, amazing. Are you going to add any more features of Azure? Azure uh, is uh, 
they're pumping out features like nobody's business. Every three months, major features. Oh coming yeah, out. It, and the prices are coming down too. Prices I love just to came this, down last week. This price war is just awesome for us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was in response to some other price cuts as well. Yep. Um, uh, anything ha that happened to Build last week? Did that affect your strategy at all? You know, there were some interesting things that came out of Build, especially with Service Bus and how it works. Okay. Uh, right now, we're we have a limit of there's 256 kilobyte is the maximum size for a message in Azure Service Bus, mm -hmm. and one of the things that 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 impacted us is that in service bus didn't know and so if you tried to put a message in it was too big you got no notification but it went away oh i see and and now as i understand it there are a lot more opportunities for us to work with azure service bus natively and, and in service bus becomes more transparent to us as we put messages in hmm. and so I, I think we're going to have better visibility when that sort of thing happens now Interesting. Um, there there were a number of things that unfortunately they're just not coming to mind right away okay we're looking at those and we say okay we get in contact with the in-service bus team and say, how's this going to impact us? How can we take advantage of that? And they say, it's in the pipeline. It's coming up. Right, right. What's the, what's the next big thing that you're working on, that little, a feature you're going to add to your product? Next feature that we're looking at is uh, customer reporting. So oh. customers are looking at us to say, OK, you know, I would mentioned when we were talking earlier about there's this hierarchy of needs when you talk about telematics. Yeah. First, where like is Maslow's it? Maslow's hierarchy yeah. of needs, right? <laughs> yeah, first, tell me where that thing is. Next, tell me if people are using it. And then tell me if there's maintenance needed. Hmm. Well, the next thing that we're going to do after that is actually to be able to upgrade the other components that are in that piece of, of, of asset. So right now we have our own telematics unit, and we can send data over the air to update it. So if we have a firmware update or a configuration update, we can update our own unit, hmm. but there's a lot of electronics on that asset. You think about it, there's an engine control module. In your passenger car, there's an airbag controller. There's a braking system. There's an oil system. All of those have electronics, and they get firmware updates. Hmm. You just usually have to take it to the service center to get them. So now we can provide an opportunity that if our equipment is loaded on your asset, we can update that remotely. You could push that firmware down to the hardware. We can push it to, if you have a combine, if you've got a tractor, a backhoe, if it's got an update, we can service that and you never have to bring the equipment in. Okay. That's a huge advantage both for the operator and for the OEM. Yep. Okay. So your, your customers are mostly um, either people that are renting heavy machinery or people that sell heavy machinery, right? That's exactly right. Okay. Um, I don't know how many of those people actually watch my show, <laughs> but if they are, where would they find out more about LHP? Then go to lhptelematics.com, and they can learn about us. Uh, they're welcome to call us. We uh, we take calls all day long. And um, Do you want to get a phone number? Yeah. Uh, well, my phone number is 317-456-2344. That's the best way to get in touch with us right now. Okay. And uh, the lhptelematics.com website will give you all the information about the services we provide. Adam, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for having me, David. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>